Libido may be defined as a person's overall sexual drive or desire for sexual activity. Libido is influenced by biological, psychological, and social factors. Sigmund Freud, who is considered the originator of the modern use of the term, defined libido as, quote, the energy regarded as a quantitative magnitude of those instincts which have to do with all that may be comprised under the word love. Libido is the instinctual energy or force contained in what Freud called the id, which for him was the strictly unconscious structure of the psyche. Much more on that later. Freud also explained that it is analogous to hunger, the will to power, and so on, insisting that it is a fundamental instinct that is innate in all humans. It is of special notice that for Freud, libido has to do with all that may be comprised under the word love. So for Freud, sexual energy and instinct all have to do with love. Would it be a better world if this were not the case? Yes and no. On another episode of this podcast, psychotherapist and love and relationship coach Anita Di Francesco has explained that it is quite possible to love someone for months or even years, during which time you are having sex with that person and in a relationship with that person without being in love with him or her. On the next level, as it were, one can have multiple soulmates in one's life, but only one true flame. We have done a brief video on this topic, which you can view and listen to on my TikTok. Carl Jung, with whom I disagree about almost everything, desexualized libido, which strikes us as a particularly absurd notion. In refreshing contrast to Jung, psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, in his Return to Freud, reasserted that libido is exclusively sexual. That having been said, Lacan preferred to reconceptualize sexual energy in terms of what he referred to as jouissance, which is an enjoyment that always has a deadly reference, a paradoxical pleasure, reaching an almost intolerable level of excitation. Lacan makes an important distinction between jouissance and plaisir, pleasure. Pleasure obeys the laws of homeostasis that Freud evokes in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, whereby, through discharge, the psyche seeks the lowest possible level of tension. It was Lacan's view, which is not necessarily totally in line with Freud's, that the pleasure principle functions as a limit imposed on enjoyment. It, plaisir, commands the subject to enjoy as little as possible. Jouissance, on the other hand, transgresses this law, and in that respect it is beyond the pleasure principle. Almost certainly beginning with the days when humans did not yet have societies or culture or civilization, or perhaps even language, they have sought ways to enhance their libido. We will review in a few moments the reasons why people have sex, and believe it or not, They are varied and are not always the ones that you think of off the top of your head. But in general, both men and women want to have better sex. How? For men, it is largely to do one way or another with their erections, getting them and sustaining them for a period long enough to have enjoyment, jouissance even perhaps, and to bring their partners to full and complete orgasm a subject which we have discussed extensively on other episodes. For women, orgasms are understandably a prime concern. If you glance at our recent episodes, you will find one which describes exactly how long, powerful, and transcendent the female orgasm can be. So, members of our species, as is our wont, turn to substances to achieve these goals. But wait a minute. Yoga and Tantra can be just as good, if not better, in assisting humans of both genders in having sexual experiences that are satisfying both physically, emotionally, and spiritually, sometimes beyond their wildest dreams. 
Tantra opens up new vistas of love and sex. Again, as we have discussed on several previous episodes with noted Tantra authority Anita Di Francesco. Before turning to aphrodisiacs, whether naturally occurring or synthetic, you may be well advised to first explore Tantra, whether or not you currently have a partner. Anita may be found at her website, www.tantrawisdom.com, and also on her own podcast, Discover Joyous Love, which is on all podcast platforms, plus YouTube. So, okay, you want to learn about aphrodisiacs. However, before we utter another word, we need to say two things. First, that this podcast does not recommend the use of any substance. Before ingesting or applying any of the ingredients mentioned, you are strongly advised to consult a healthcare professional trained in Western medicine, in Eastern medicine, Ayurvedic or traditional Chinese, or both. Second, date rape is a reprehensible activity, and beyond that, it is a crime. We know persons who have been victims of date rape after being involuntarily administered GHB, gamma-hydroxylbutyric acid, rohypnol, the widely available zolpidem, Ambien, chloral hydrate, MDMA, ecstasy, and other drugs. A woman drinks a glass of wine and suddenly becomes an object with limited consciousness or will. It is not a question of the woman, quote, losing her inhibition, unquote. It is more a question of her being turned into an object and assaulted, sometimes repeatedly and by more than one man. We also know of cases of men returning to consciousness and realizing that they have been anally raped. It is the opinion of this podcast that there is no such thing as a safe, fun, party drug. Yes, there is a rave culture, although that was dying down even before COVID appeared. Yes, there are both women and men who want to have sex with a number of people in a party context. But drugs of any kind, with the limited exception of alcohol within limits and the milder forms of cannabis, should not be a part of that. You can have a lot of fun without losing control to the extent that you are having sex with someone you do not wish to have sex with. I once heard a story about a woman who attended a sex party, the host of which was a very unattractive man with whom she definitely did not wish to have sex. Then things happened. Lots of alcohol was consumed, perhaps also some drugs, and all of a sudden she realized that this man was having sex with her. She was angry, both at the man and at herself. He had violated her boundaries. He realized that perfectly well. But that was the point. He was expressing that he was in control. Typical male behavior taken beyond its appropriate limits. Now in general, we here at Explore Ecstatic Sensuality are in favor of orgies. But there are basic understandings entered into for any specific orgy event. In general, men are not expected to have sex with other men, even if sex involving multiple individuals in erotic physical contact is occurring. Women typically do have sex with other women at most orgies, but are always free to say no in any specific instance. Some women will not have sex with other women at group sex events unless they are the initiators, and so forth. All of these topics and many more are discussed in flagrant detail in our episode on polyamory, which I am certain that most of you will want to check out immediately, if not sooner. But first, an aphrodisiac is a substance that increases sexual desire, sexual attraction, sexual pleasure, or sexual behavior. Substances range from a variety of plants, spices, foods, and synthetic chemicals. They can be classified by their chemical properties. That is to say, Substances occurring naturally in nature and unnatural, which is to say, synthetic in one way or another. Substances that may be regarded as natural aphrodisiacs, cannabis and cocaine, to cite two examples, are further classified into plant-based and non-plant-based substances. 
unnatural aphrodisiacs along the lines of MDMA, ecstasy, and methamphetamine are classified as those that are manufactured to imitate a natural substance. Aphrodisiacs can also be classified by their type of purported effects, i.e. psychological or physiological. Aphrodisiacs that contain hallucinogenic properties like bufotenin have psychological effects on a person that can increase sexual desire and sexual pleasure. Aphrodisiacs that contain smooth muscle relaxing properties like yohimbine have physiological effects on a person that can affect hormone levels and increase blood flow. Yohimbine is a substance found in the bark of yohim trees in West Africa and therefore is plant-based. It was traditionally used in West African cultures in which the bark would be boiled and the resulting water drunk until its effects showed proven benefits in increasing sexual desire. There is also horny goat weed, Epidemia herba, as used in Chinese folk medicine under the name Ying Yang Huo. It was thought useful for improving sexual desire, sexual pleasure, and or sexual behavior. Horny goat weed contains Icarin, a flavanol glycoside. And this is more or less what the standard scientific sources have to tell us about aphrodisiacs. In this episode, we are going to attempt a more extensive historical and contemporary review of both aphrodisiacs and love filters. More on those in a moment. Areas covered will include aphrodisiacs broadly defined in Ayurvedic health regimens as well as a further discussion of psychedelics as they relate to sexuality overall. However, before we do so, I would like to make a few more introductory remarks. To start off with, we are going to ask the question, why do men and women want to have sex in the first place? Sure, you can say that aphrodisiacs get one horny, to coin a phrase, but this avoids the broader issue. In the journal Archives of Sexual Behavior, Cindy M. Meston of the University of Texas at Austin and David M. Buss of the same institution published perhaps the most comprehensive exploration to date of the reasons people express for having sexual intercourse. Identifying 237 distinct motivations ranging from the mundane, e.g., I wanted to experience physical pleasure, to the spiritual, e.g., I wanted to get closer to God. From altruistic, e.g., I wanted the person to feel good about himself or herself, to the vengeful, e.g., I wanted to get back at my partner for having cheated on me. 142 of them loaded into four primary factors and 13 sub-factors that were equivalent in men and women. Physical, stress reduction, pleasure, physical desirability, and experience seeking. Goal attainment, resources, social status, revenge, and utilitarian. Emotional, love and commitment and expression. And insecurity, self-esteem boost, duty slash pressure, and mate guarding. The most frequently endorsed reasons for having sex, if taken at face value, reflect what motivates most people most of the time. Attraction, pleasure, affection, love, romance, emotional closeness, arousal, the desire to please, adventure, excitement, experience, connection, celebration, curiosity, and opportunity. There are gender differences in this. Dietrich Klusmann, in an article published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior, and Sandra Leiblung and colleagues, in an article published in the Journal of Sex Medicine, suggested that in addition to increasing intimacy with their partner, women may be motivated to engage in sex because they want to increase their own well-being and sense of feeling sexually desirable. Meston and Buss found that, on the other hand, men, more than women, endorsed reasons for having sex that involved a variety of utilitarian functions. To change the topic of conversation, to get a favor from someone, to improve my sexual skills. 
These findings contradict the stereotype that women, more than men, use sex to obtain special favors or treatment. So, guys out there, ask yourself the question, how many of you were motivated to have sex with the woman you were hanging out with in order to change the topic of conversation? Golly. I find this research fascinating. However, before we move on, I would like to offer my own opinion. There are women and men who do not or cannot or do not wish to have sex, or should I say, have genital sex. Some individuals, due to birth defects, have malformed genitals which cannot be dealt with surgically. Yes, in some cases, people can, quote, correct, unquote, these issues via transgender surgery and therapy, but not everyone with malformed genitals wishes to change their genders. Beyond that, there are men and women, probably more women than men, whose interest in having sex and desire to have sex are lessened by body shame, being overweight being a prime example. So here, we have eliminated a bunch of people so that we are left with individuals who have a desire for sex, or let us say instead, for sexual intimacy. Of this rather large group, and I am including both those who are in a relationship and those who are not, there are men and women who are interested in having sex only with people of their own preferred gender to whom they are physically, sexually slash aesthetically, attracted. In our view, this is normal and healthy. But within this group, there are, sad to say, those who are too unattractive to have sex with those to whom they are attracted. To put it bluntly, they can never get laid unless they ignore physical attractiveness of their potential sex partners altogether. This reminds me of a very old song by the English rock group The Kinks, from which I shall now quote, Who cares if you're Jewish or your breath smells of garlic and your nose is a shiny red light? To me you are gorgeous and everything's right when I turn out the living room light. But I don't have to see you the way that you are when I turn out the living room light, when I turn off the living room light. I don't have to see you the way that you are when I turn off the living room light. Your nose may be bulbous, your face may be spotty, your skin may be wrinkled and tight, but I don't want to see you the way that you are, so I turn off the living room light. We don't feel so ugly, we don't feel so draggy, we don't feel so twisted up tight. And we don't feel as ugly as we really are when we turn off the living room light. When we turn off the living room light, we don't feel as ugly as we really are when we turn off the living room light. I suppose that the greatest blessing in life is to be attracted only to people at your own level of attractiveness. But alas, that's just not the way the world works. So wherever you go, you see attractive people with other attractive people, attractive heterosexual couples, attractive gay couples, smiling, kissing, embracing, holding hands. And all of a sudden you get the feeling that you are a member of a different species. It is as if you are a leftover Neanderthal in a world of homo sapiens who want nothing to do with you. Alas, this episode has nothing to offer for you. Aphrodisiacs will not work. Love filters most certainly will not work. However, there is hope. We have been promising this to you for a very, very long time. And now, at long last, it's in the can. Explore Ecstatic Sensuality's special bonus episode, The Unattractive Person's Guide to How to Get Laid. Debbie Mosier of Podcast Review and her blog has already called it the Podcast Episode of the Year. Ken Jimson wrote in Podcast Magazine, a top contender and the one I am betting on for the People's Choice Podcast Award. And the kudos keep coming in. We can scarcely keep up with them. And always remember, turn out the living room light. Okay, we've left unattractive people behind for the moment, hopefully permanently. 
Go sulk and feel sorry for yourselves. Everything else we'll have to say here will be for attractive people only. However, and this is important, it should be obvious to everyone, although sometimes it is not. It is perfectly acceptable to love someone in a way that is not physical in any way. I love you, but I do not and never will want to sleep with you. This is very hard for men to say. Men are afraid that if they say any sentence containing the word love to a woman, she may jump to the delusion that they want to sleep with that woman. Unless, needless to say, those females or children are extremely old, over 60 or 70. Women tend to be rather careless in this regard. Men frequently jump to the delusion that if a woman signs something love, that means that the woman's feelings are physical, sensual, erotic, when they are merely emotional. Women feel that they can write love to an unattractive man with impunity. Surely he will never take that seriously. Or if I put XO or XOXO or XOV or XOYOBO at the end of an email, he certainly will not jump to the delusion that I actually want to hug him. Or worse, kiss him. The very idea of any physical contact with that individual, and thank heaven there's only one of him, makes me nauseous. And kissing him, yeah. He has some semblance of a brain and two eyes in his head behind those ugly glasses of his. Well, at least they cover up his ugly eyes. And didn't I communicate to him that I am out of his league? But come to think of it, who is in his league? You don't even want to go there. How on God's earth could that creepy dweeb have ever gotten any ideas about me? I am gorgeous, and he's just... What can I say? Yucky poo. The only individual who would ever want to sleep with him is his teddy bear, and she only under duress. This is sometimes difficult territory to navigate. Reading people up front is a science in a certain way. And before we move on, I need to emphasize that so much misconduct on the part of men, up to and including rape and even murder, is based on a man's inability to read a woman. And it's not a matter of reading, quote, a woman's signals, unquote. If in every encounter with a man, a woman felt the need to send out, no, I will never want to sleep with you, signals, it would exhaust her energies to the extent that she would begin to avoid social contact with men altogether. And in fact, many women do precisely that. And not all of them, as men suppose, become lesbians. Unquote. Because of male behavior, many women feel safer, more comfortable, more appreciated, and yes, more loved if they live in a world of women. This reminds me of a novelette by one of my favorite writers, the Italian Cesare Pavese, entitled Tradone Sole, Among Women Only, which Michelangelo Antonioni adapted for the screen. Antonioni's film version is called Le Amiche, and is very highly recommended by this podcast. From a certain perspective, this episode is a companion piece to our upcoming show on flirtation and seduction. Flirtation, which should be an ongoing mode of behavior throughout a relationship, is the strongest aphrodisiac, and the strongest love filter we can think of. Beyond that, we here in the Western world are burdened by a societal, and cultural belief that penetration sex, including orgasm achieved solely by means of penetration, is the be-all and end-all of erotic activity. This strikes us as something of a shame. Let's take kissing, for example. Kissing is so wonderful. It is in many ways the most intimate and expressive form of physical intimacy. People regard it as a way to get hot, as a prelude to sex, which demonstrates to me that they lack sensuality at a basic level. The tongue is in many ways our greatest implement of sensuality, not only orally, but all over the body. Dogs, by the way, understand this. The tongue and also the lips. 
people should learn to focus on their lips, to develop sensuality in their lips. Reflecting the general theme of this podcast, maximum sensuality is essential for a more exciting sex life, whether you are with one lover or many. And by the way, having many lovers is fine. This podcast shows you how to make this happen in relationships, dating, casual sex, and intimacy, as well as in group sex and orgies. Sensuality is also the path towards spiritual love and spiritual sex. Your sensual self is your spiritual self. There is no difference. Sensuality enhances your passion and your creativity in all aspects of your life, from business, through sports, through the arts. Sensuality is the essence of pleasure. And finally, do you have your time travel passports and boarding cards ready? You are certain to own a bleep load of bonus miles on this journey. First, we shall party hardy in ancient Greece. Scholar Harry E. Wedek has suggested, and we quote, that artificial aids and inducements to amatory performance were far less necessary there and then than they are in our highly complex and competitive and, in a sense, exhaustive, contemporary social frame. Hence, we do not constantly hear, in the ancient Greek text, of the ad hoc use of filters, potions, and analogous means of stimulation. Yet their existence is established, and in particular cases, they were brought into effective use. Pliny the Elder records that Xenocrates, a Greek physician of the first century A.D., advised drinking the sap of mallows as a love potion, such a filter, along with three mallow roots tied in a bunch, would inflame the erotic passions of women even more than a glance from myself. Just making sure that you're listening. And by the way, I'm not going to tell those stories today. Dioscortes of Cilicia in Asia Minor was an army physician who lived during the first century of our era. In order to produce intense excitation and sexual impulse, the worthy doctor recommended the roots of boy cabbage soaked in fresh goat's milk. Satyrion is a plant referred to by several Greek and Roman authors. However, sadly, there is a great deal of uncertainty today as to what plant that name referred to. It is suggested that it may merely have been ragwort, Jacobii vulgaris. The two fathers of herbalism, John Gerard and Nicholas Culpepper, also recommended this herb. Culpepper was an astrological botanist who lived in the first half of the 17th century. He believed that ragwort slash satyrion was under the command of Dame Venus, and it literally cleanses, digests, and discusses. In the ancient world, remarkable properties were attributed to the root of satyrion. When it was dissolved in goat's milk, the erotic effect was so vigorous and urgent that according to Theophrastus, the potion produced, on a certain occasion, some 70 consecutive coital performances. Yowza! Another species of satyrion was erythraceon. According to both Pliny and Dioscorides, the mere holding of it in one's hand led to lustful desires. Another plant used by the Greeks for amatory purposes was telephalon, which may be translated love from afar. Along the lines of television, or its German equivalent fernsehen, far-seeing. According to Theocritus, lovers were accustomed to guess by the leaf of the telephalon plant placed between the forefinger and thumb of the left hand and then struck by the right, whether their love was reciprocated. If a loud crack was heard, then indeed there was reciprocal love. And you know, my dear friends, and as we have discussed earlier, sometimes it really is hard to tell. And as a reminder, sometimes someone loving you is distinctly different from someone being in love with you or, even more important, wanting to have sex with you. Many broken hearts lie asleep in the deep, so beware, beware. And did you know that the Roman Emperor Alacritus suffered from premature ejaculation? It's amazing what you find out listening to this podcast. 
Theophrastus and Dioscorides both attested that cyclamen had erotic properties. The root of the plant was used as an ingredient in love potions. I shall proceed with a brief mention of some other plants considered to have, if you will, aphrodisiac properties. Storgethron, a plant used in ancient Greece for amatory purposes, may in fact be merely the leek. The spice tarragon has been suggested, as has Angelicae pubescentis radix, by the medieval philosopher St. Albertus Magnus. The Trinum Magicum, Siwe Secretorum Magicorum, the magical trinity, or secrets of magic. The Trinum Magicum, 1614, republished 1616, was edited by a certain Caesar Longinus. It was possibly the work of the controversial Zagreb-born philosopher and theologian Paulus Scalicius, Pavel Scalic, 1534-1575, although his authorship is not acknowledged. And who knows, it might in fact be an ancient text, bearing in mind that Longinus is the name given to the unnamed Roman soldier who pierced the side of Jesus with a lance, and who, in medieval and some modern Christian traditions, is described as a convert to Christianity. His name first appeared in the apocryphal Gospel of Nicodemus. Here is an excerpt from this work on magic and magical secrets, translated by myself from the Latin. The seventh herb of Venus is called Pistoriona, and the other Hiroborus, that is, the herb of doves and verbena. It is effective in Aphronides, in Greek Aphronides, that is, in sexual intercourse, because its makeup increases a lot of sperm when someone desired intercourse, and the greater virtue of the herb itself is if someone drinks it a lot during sexual intercourse. Nevertheless, if a man eats it in his house, or in his vineyard, or on his land, he shall keep nothing but this herb, and he shall repay his wages. Its root is more powerful to all those who want to plant vines to cover themselves, and madmen to water themselves, well disciplined and fond of learning, and they will be happy and prosperous. It also works well in purification and repels all demons. Aphrodites is a very curious word to which we can find no other references. Here Caesar Longinus tells us that it is a synonym for sexual intercourse. Getting hungry yet? I know you're already horny. Then let's take a hop, a skip, and a jump to do some spelunking in China. Dun Huang manuscripts refer to a wide variety of religious and secular documents, mostly manuscripts, but also including some woodblock printed texts, in China and other languages that were discovered at the Mogao Caves in Dunhuang, China, during the 20th century. The majority of the surviving texts come from a large cache of documents produced between the late 4th and early 11th centuries, which had been sealed in the so-called Library Cave, Cave 17, at some point in the early 11th century. The Library Cave was discovered by a Taoist monk called Wang Yang Lu in 1900. A number of Buddhist therapeutic sources were discovered among the manuscripts of Dong Huang Mogao Cave 17. Some of them contain prescriptions for remedying ailments that early or medieval Chinese bibliographers would have placed under the purview of the way of seduction. If a man wishes to obtain the love of a woman, then he should take soil from under his sandals and mix it with ale. Then he should offer this mixture to drink to a woman, and there will be mutual love. Yuck, might be the response from some of my audience. At any rate, there is no indication in the instructions that the target of this recipe, the woman, was cognizant of what she was drinking. Were she actually interested in developing feelings for a man, she would likely not require such aids. Moreover, the ingredients used in preparing this mixture have no discernible medicinal value, and the condition is apparently nothing more than an absence of affection or attraction. There are no underlying physiological issues hindering sexual functions. 
Yet, despite having all the hallmarks of a love filter, the recipe is recorded among other remedies. Section 80, columns 87 to 88, contains a recipe equally related to matrimonial harmony. By collecting some soil from the hoof of a white horse and placing it under the bed of an unfaithful wife, she will reveal the name of her lover during her sleep. In India, the categories that make up the eightfold scheme sometimes shift depending on the text and the period, but most accounts agree on the following as the traditional branches of classical Indian Ayurveda. 1. Internal medicine. 2. Head and neck disorders. 3. Surgical removal of foreign bodies. 4. Toxicology. 5. Demonology. 6. Pediatrics. 7. Longevity. and 8. Potency therapy. The final category, potency therapy, Vaj e Karana, concerns sexual and reproductive undertakings. In contrast to early and medieval Chinese sources, coterminous Indian materials that deal with potency therapy do not discriminate between aphrodisiacs and love filters. Physiological impediments to arousal or intercourse were still distinguished from psychological barriers but both were treated with the same types of recipe and classified under the same rubric. Some remedies for impotency addressed anxiety, bashfulness, or repulsion in partners that were a priori unprepared or unwilling. That is, a priori unprepared or unwilling to have sex. Texts that are relevant to potency therapy include Karaka Samhita and the Susruta Samhita. For example, the compendium of Chakara, Kakara Samhita, dating from around the late 2nd or 3rd centuries of the Christian era, contains recipes for, quote, lustful men who desire the favor of women, unquote, to borrow Kenneth Zisk's description. In other words, love filters designed to make potential sex partners more responsive to advances were on equal therapeutic footing with aphrodisiacs that targeted physical impediments to intercourse. A few generations after Bao Yang's inventory of classical Indian medical disciplines circulated in China, sexual potency was established as a discipline of medical knowledge and practice in Buddhist manuscript literature. This came part and parcel with the Ayurvedic collapse of aphrodisiacs and love filters into the same category a development that would considerably alter the landscape of Chinese medicine. In accordance with earlier indigenous Chinese attitudes, non-Buddhist and non-medical manuscripts found in Donghuang approach the arts of the bedchamber as potentially therapeutic techniques. The case in point is the Rhapsody on Great Pleasure attributed to the writer Bao Xingjiang, 1776 to 1826 A.D., as illustrated in the following passage, the Rhapsody contains technical details related to topics such as aphrodisiacs and sexual hygiene more broadly. When using the arts of the bedchamber, execute the nine shallow thrusts and then the single deep thrust. Wait for the ten signs. After these occur, the method is completed. For all of you thrust counters out there. There must be some in my audience here. In the same way, many Dung Huang materials considered spellbinding a semantic art distinct from nourishing life or paramedical considerations. P2610V, a manuscript devoted to the topic of divination with a focus on hemorology, includes an extended series of prescriptions under the title, quote, Secret Methods of Seizing Women and Wives, unquote. That this collection of spellbinding recipes was nestled among divination instructions is not uncommon. As noted earlier, spellbinding and its subgenre, the way of seduction, traditionally fell under the heading of mantic arts, shushu. Early medieval sources, most notably Taoist ones, specifically list obtaining, or alternatively seeking, young women and wives as a divination method. 
Here is a pair of representative recipes from the, quote, secret methods of seizing women and wives. If a wife wishes to make her husband love her, she should obtain the soil from the paws of the family dog and administer it under her husband's navel. He will then love his wife. Unquote. Quote, when a man seeks a woman for illicit relations, he should write her full name on a Genzi day and then burn it to ashes. He must mix the ashes with ale and drink the concoction. The filter is effective immediately. Hmm, I've got to try that one. In Ma Huang Dewey literature, the arts of the bedchamber, and more generally, nourishing life, were already paramedical, so the medicalization of aphrodisiacs in the medieval Dong Huang materials is not an unexpected development. S4433, a short medical text on reproductive matters, contains the following recipe for an aphrodisiac. To delight women and invigorate men, take five flavor berry, Shisandra kinanessa, thin leaf milkwort, Polygala tenifoflora, and Moniere's snow parsley, Snimmon Moniera, and reduce these ingredients into a powder that is to be applied on the head of the male organ. Thrust should be deep. After a little while, trembling will occur. Unquote. Among the Dung Huang manuscripts, we find the following recipe for a love filter in P3914, a Buddhist manual entitled For Realizing One's Wishes. Among Dung Huang manuscripts, we find the following recipe for a love filter in 3914, a Buddhist manual entitled, quote, For Realizing One's Wishes. If you love someone, take two kun of the wood of Cirrus, Alabesia Lebek, Cut it into 108 pieces, reciting the spell every time you divide it. When roasting the pieces in a fire, call out the other person's name. Proceed likewise one double hour per day for three days, and the person will immediately love another, namely you, to death. Another one to try. Vajra Kumara, a transformation body of Amitabha, the Buddha of Infinite Longevity, is closely tied to love filters in Dong Huang materials. A medieval Buddhist alchemical current developed around the figures of Nagarjuna and Asvagosha slash Bodhisattva Horsenai. It prescribes rubbing the ashes of beehives onto the male organ to achieve an increase of up to three inches in length and a considerable improvement in girth as well. This method also affords protection against demonic, malady-causing pathogens. Additionally, it results in fragrant excretions, keen senses, and quietude, all hallmarks of Buddhist attainment. Here are more medical treatments for remedying the absence of affection or intimacy. Nagarjuna's recipe says, Take the heart of a mandarin duck and dry it in the shade for a hundred days. Tie it to your arm and do not let anyone know about it. There will be mutual affection between you and the object of your intentions. Another method relates. If in your heart you love a girl but cannot obtain her by any means, write her name on fourteen sheets of paper and drink its ashes with fragrant well water while facing east at the Rishu time, sunrise. It will surely be effective. Keep this method secret and do not transmit it. All of these methods are definitely going to keep me busy. Buddhism and its elaborate web of transmission networks proved an effective conduit for the dissemination of Ayurvedic medical knowledge. Perhaps this would be a good point for a divagation on the topic of Ayurvedic medicine in general. One aspect of Ayurveda that until recently would be considered revolutionary by today's standards of medical care and research, is that we are not all the same person. Only now, through the power of modern technological medicine, 
is Western medicine acknowledging something that Ayurveda has always known. Namely, that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to many medical, sexual, emotional, and mental imbalances and issues. In Ayurveda, we are thought of as microcosms of the macrocosm of the universe, and therefore, all of the elements that occur in our universe are present in us, including ether, air, fire, water, and earth. The proportions and relations of these elements comprising our bodies account for our uniqueness physiologically and psychologically. The study of Tantra takes this one step further to embrace the essential nature of the masculine and feminine within each of us, recognizing that one cannot exist without the other. And once again, we refer you to our source on Tantra, www.tantrawisdom.com. I repeat, www tantrawisdom.com. According to Ayurveda, we all digest our foods, thoughts, emotions, and even our spiritual and sexual experiences differently. We react to the seasons, exercise, sexual patterns, and sleep in ways that are unique to our constitutional type or what is called our dosha. Ayurveda teaches that we are more than our physical body. We have, if truth be told, five layers or sheaths to our being. These are explained in the Indian Tait Tir Iya Upanishad, and they are the shield of physical health. The energy shield, the psychological or shield of the mind, the Manno Maya Kosha, the wisdom shield, and the bliss shield. As the Healing Unresolved Trauma, H-U-R-T, study revealed in 2013, old emotional wounds can be triggered in women decades later and felt as if they are current, thereby adversely affecting sexual desire. From an Ayurvedic perspective, this makes perfect sense. Any toxin, be it physical, mental, such as an incomplete thought, or emotional, such as a held-onto trauma, can impair mental and bodily functions. These result in the toxin called ama. Ama can adversely affect sexual desire, enjoyment, and function. Herbal remedies for sexual issues include herbal remedies for detoxification, stoking digestive fire, enhancing ojas, and supporting reproductive tissues. The datus are the constituent elements that provide structure and support to the body. A low libido can result from weak shukra datu. The shukra datu is last in the subsequent formation of datus from rasa datu, and hence it contains the essence of all the other datus, and is the most refined one. A healthy and balanced shukra datu supports creative instinct and ability to reach completion of a project. The following herbal remedies are useful for enhancing libido. For women, warm one teaspoon of shatavari, asparagus rosimosus, and one teaspoon of virari kanda, lipomosa digitata, in one cup of warm milk, and drink before bedtime. For men, warm one teaspoon ashwagandha, with Ania somnifera, in one half teaspoon of Vidari Kanda, in one cup of warm milk, and drink it before bedtime. Ayurveda places great importance on strengthening ojas after male ejaculation. There are many recipes taught for men to use before and after sexual activity. Probably the easiest is to peel raw almonds that have soaked overnight in water. Pour off the water and place in a blender with a cup of warm milk. Blend with one pitted date and one pinch each of ginger, nutmeg, and saffron. Drink after any sexual activity that ends in ejaculation. For premature ejaculation, a concoction of the following is recommended. Cinnamon, long pepper, cardamom, nutmeg, mace, pine nuts, dried ginger, cloves, dried coconut flakes, and saffron. Take one quarter cup daily with warm milk. 
An herbal formula for erectile dysfunction is as follows. Warm one teaspoon of ashwagandha, one half teaspoon of bala, sida kofa difolia, one half teaspoon of chopped garlic, and one half teaspoon of vidare kanda in one cup of warm milk. Drink twice daily for at least three months. So following that Ayurvedic divigation, we now return to ancient Chinese texts and documents, and specifically to Ayurvedics and love filters in medieval Chinese Buddhist canonical texts. Buddhism, with its elaborate web of transmission networks, proved an effective conduit for the dissemination of Ayurvedic medical knowledge. We can find evidence of this in the handful of examples from Dunhuang Buddhist manuscripts. In these materials, the focus appears to have been on love filters, that is, recipes to elicit emotional and sexual interest in others, and their medicalization. To my knowledge, there are no clear examples of Buddhist aphrodisiacs in the Dunhuang manuscripts. The market for aphrodisiacs in early and medieval China was cornered by indigenous traditions such as the arts of the bedchamber, which did not, however, preclude their recipes from being brought into the medical fold along with love filters. With the ongoing porousness between Ayurvedic potency therapy, the way of seduction, and the arts of the bedchamber, these disciplines became increasingly imbricated in the medieval period. Both aphrodisiacs and love filters were afforded their own sections in exhaustive medical treatises. We now turn to an article entitled Potency Therapy and Classical Indian Medicine by Kenneth, known as Ken G. Zisk, published in 2004 in the journal Asian Medicine, and we quote him. Here in the West, we may recall the whimsical aphrodisiac formula called Love Potion No. 9, famous from the 1950s hit song by the black vocal group The Coasters. As I recall, it smelled like turpentine and looked like Indian ink, but the effects were apparently fantastic. It caused the man to kiss everything in sight, even a cop down on 34th and Vine, who then broke the little bottle of Love Potion No. 9. In India, where male virility is backed by Hindu law, dharma, the promotion and sale of aphrodisiacs are highly visible. Nearly every Indian newspaper routinely carries advertisements about wonder drugs that promise male potency and assure male offspring. Special potency clinics and virility specialists are found in almost every city, town, and village. Male potency is a thriving industry in India today. Traditional Indian ideas about impotency, virility, and potency therapy were initially presented principally in two classical treatises of Indian medicine, the Kakra and the Susmu Sarvitas, both of which date from a few centuries B.C. to a few centuries A.D. Karaka begins his discussion with the social justification for potency therapy. Their Brahminic rationale for sexual intercourse, running through all the books that deal with Hindu law or Dharma, is quite simply procreation, in particular the production of male offspring. In a language reminiscent of the Brahminic law books, Dharma Asastras, Karaka recommends that a self-determined young man should daily seek potency therapy, for on what does duty, Dharma, and prosperity, Artha, depend, likewise fondness, pretty, and fame, by us? Surely it is the abode of a son, and these qualities have sons as their seats. With the help of commentators, we understand that Karaka establishes an inextricable connection between righteousness, Dharma, and potency therapy. When an intelligent young man uses potency therapy for purposes of procreation, as sanctioned by dharma, he becomes sexually aroused, which leads to intercourse resulting in a male issue who, according to dharmic rule, affects the father's well-being both in this world and in the next. In this way, there is interdependence between the father's success, his son's, and the potency therapy he uses to obtain them. 
Susuruta offers no such Brahminic justification for the use of aphrodisiacs, opting instead for more medical reasons and explanations. Potency therapy, he says, has its motive the filling out, the purification, the increase, and the production of insufficient, defective, weak, and dried-up semen, and has as its purpose the production of sexual arousal. Whether for production of a male issue, according to Karaka, or for heightened sexual pleasure, according to Susruta, the best results are obtained when the formulas of potency therapy are properly used. All formulas, with few exceptions, are meant to be consumed as food. There are no recipes that are applied to the sexual organs, as one finds in books of Kamasastra, like the Kimi Sutra and the Ratirahasya. Although the recipes are different in each book, they all contain many of the same major ingredients, which, aside from some specialized herbs, have properties that add weight and bulk to the body. Most of the non-meat recipes are vegetable-based, containing as primary ingredients variations of the following. Take notes here. Black gram, cowage fruit, asparagus, milty yam, bamboo, wheat, barley, and white rice. Often grapes, sugarcane, or dates are added, along with clarified butter and milk. And the whole thing is usually sweetened with ground white sugar and honey. There is also a symbolic association between male sexual organs and semen and the different fruits, seeds, and plant stems used. The different recipes are prepared as pills, soups, fritters, different kinds of cakes, and medicated clarified butter. Milk is the other principal ingredient in non-wheat formulas. It yields milk drinks, gruel, and potages. Foot balms are also presented for this purpose by Susruta. Clarified butter, prepared with the testicles of an alligator or a mouse, or the eggs of a frog or a sparrow, kafata. A man makes himself strong by means of this foot balm, but he should not touch the ground. As long as he does not touch the ground, the man can have coitus without interruption. Hmm. Baghata the Elder offers a variant of this formula in two forms that use only vegetable ingredients. After applying a foot balm consisting of long-leafed Valeria arsabi and cowage fruits, a man does not lose his ability for sexual arousal throughout the night. The foot balm consisting of hogweed root, grapes, and cowage fruits is also successful, but the man should not touch the ground with his foot. The idea that not touching the feet to the ground helps sustain sexual vigor occurs in yet another recipe given by Bhagbata the Elder. In this case, however, the formula is consumed by licking rather than being rubbed on the feet. The man who licks the quantity of one piku, one half grams, of a preparation of herbs mixed with clarified butter and honey at dawn, and who does not touch the ground with his feet, obtains strength and fortitude, and makes love to a woman like a stallion. <laughs> Something else to try. The precise meanings of these special aphrodisiacs are not discussed by the different commentators, but similar recipes occur in two medieval Kamasastra treatises, which prescribe that herbal balms should be applied to the feet in order to prevent premature ejaculation. It remains a mystery why the man was forbidden to walk or stand on the ground after application. It is clear, however, that this is a unique type of aphrodisiac in the Indian medical tradition, which may have originated from traditions of Indian erotic love. History is rich with examples of aromatic love potions being used as powerful mood boosters. We're talking here, at least in part, on olfactory senses. Senses of smell. Here is a brief overview. Jasmine. Jasminum grandiflorum. Cleopatra wooed Mark Antony with the aroma of jasmine, and to this day, in India, a paste is made of the flowers for use as an aphrodisiac. Another variety of jasmine, known as jasminum sambac, has similar uplifting mood qualities and pairs perfectly with rose and other essential oils, such as pink peppercorn. 
Skinus Terabinathora. India, again, provides us with real-time evidence of the power of jasmine. Women wear daily sprigs of fresh jasmine in their hair. Its auspicious romantic influence is also evident at Indian weddings. Jasmine flowers are used as garlands and decorations and scattered on marriage beds. Rose, Rosa Damascena. Similarly, the essence of oil of rose, discovered between 1582 and 1612, has a very vibrant romantic history. Sappho, the Greek poet, called it the queen of flowers. Cooper is rumored to have bribed the god of silence with rose so that he would not reveal the amorous ways of Venus. An enchanting story is told about the discovery of rose oil. At the wedding feast of Shah Jahan, who built the Taj Mahal and Shalomar Gardens for his wife, a canal circling the whole garden was dug and filled with water and rose petals. The sun's heat separated the water from the essential oil of rose. The bridal pair observed this when they were rowing in the fragrant water. The oil was skimmed off and found to be an exquisite perfume. History tells us that this was the beginning of rose distillation in India. Today, the oil of rose and rose petals support emotional health. Add to a bath blend used in bath balm recipes or diffused into the air. Imagine soaking in a luxurious warm bath filled with rose petals and rich with warm, intensely floral, slightly spicy, honey-like odor of rose essential odor. Hmm. Be fun to do with someone. Mm -hmm. Not just alone. Sandalwood, Santalum album. Rose also blends well with sandalwood. The woody, aromatic notes of sandalwood create romantic alchemy that can induce deep, luxurious relaxation. It is known to have a sedative action, but as a longer-lasting aroma, it is commonly added to soaps, bath bombs, foot scrubs, and body moisturizing products, and will help provide lasting love memories. Sandalwood essential oil is distilled from the root and heartwood of the sandal tree. The traditional source from India is endangered because of over-harvesting. However, fortunately, other countries, such as Australia, have invested in sustainable plantation, and their oil is superb. Ginger, with a warm, fresh, woody, spicy, almost citrus top note, blends well with cedarwood and Himalcanea. This is an essential oil to enhance your love celebrations. Lavender, Lavandulus officinalis. And still she slept an azure-lidded sleep in blanched linen, smoothed in lavender. The poet Keats hit the nail on the head in the beautiful poem, The Eve of St. Agnes, where he waxes eloquent on the seducing, sedative benefits of lavender. Another great herb and essential oil to add to your love apothecary. In fact, lavender herb and essential oil are both known as powerful supports for gently soothing away tensions and are two products your apothecary needs year-round. Needless to say, lavender is still highly recommended today. I love lavender. I mean, I'm crazy about it. I have a ritual I do. When I bring a guy home for some action, I always light a bunch of candles and spray my bed with lavender, pillow, and room spray. The response I get is truly amazing. Men really love it. Almost all have commented on the fragrance and said my bed and room were so comfortable and they love the way it smells. I don't know if it's helped turn them on, but I do know nobody has complained yet. From the Happy Hookup, A Single Girl's Guide to Casual Sex by Alexa Joy Sherman and Nicole Tokenton. If this intrigues you, be sure to check out our episode on casual sex, hookup sex, booty calls, drunk dialing, those sorts of things. To proceed, here are some possible ingredients for a love potion oil. Argon Argania Spinosa, 2 ounces. 
sweet almond oil or apricot kernel oil, two ounces, lavender oil, three to five drops, rose, one to two drops, jasmine, one to two drops, sandalwood, centalum album oil, one to two drops. Blend these essential oils together and use in the bath or use as a body massage oil. So, um, for two partners, I can easily imagine them massaging each other with an oil of this sort. It's time just to take a breath and fantasize for a moment. All of my friends out there. Before we get really trippy on you, as our parents or grandparents used to say, and I know how much you've been waiting for this section, let us speak more about certain aphrodisiacs concerning which we have thus far made only glancing references. In Western cultures, a widely known and used aphrodisiac plant is the mandrake, Mandragora officinarum, a native of the Near East. The root, which purportedly contains medicinal juices, is branched and spindle-shaped. Using one's imagination, a particular root may resemble a human, a man, or a woman. From biblical times onward, according to the doctrine of signatures, the form of the root indicated the sex of a person on which it would be effective. The mandrake was also used as an aphrodisiac and soporific agent in ancient times. These properties, as well as its reputed aphrodisiac ones, are thought to reside mainly in root extracts. Chemical analysis has shown the plant to contain several narcotic alkaloids, including hypocyamine, scopalamine, and madrogamine. From the earliest times, mandrake was a customary ingredient in love potions. The Greeks considered the root of the mandrake an amatory excitant, and for this reason, Aphrodite was sometimes referred to as Aphrodite mandragoritis, she of the mandrake. Pliny the Elder tells us that when a mandrake root has grown into something resembling male genitals, it will certainly attract and secure the love of a woman. Aurauna, the German word for mandrake, is the title of one of my favorite novels written in 1911 by Hans Heinz Evers. Evers' novel has been adapted for the silver screen several times, the first example worthy of mention being in 1928. Also known as Unholy Love, it is a 125 black and white silent German film directed by Henrik Heinrich Galen. It stars Brigitte Helm as Aurauna and Paul Wegener as the scientist Professor Jakob Ten Brinken. It uses the novel and is regarded by critics as the definitive version of Aurauna. Brigitte Helm reprised the role of Alrauna in a 1938 remake directed by Richard Oswald. It was remade once again in 1952, starring one of my favorite actresses, Hildegard Kneff and Eric von Stroheim. Sadly, this particular remake does not take full advantage of the sexuality of Hildegard Kneff. This is my opinion. Ginseng may today be the most widely used aphrodisiac, like the mandrake, its branched root resembles a human form. Two types of ginseng are available. American ginseng, Panax quinquefolius, is raised commercially in Appalachia and the Ozarks for shipment almost exclusively to the Orient. On the other hand, roots of Asian Panax species are used in the United States. As its generic name suggests, Ginseng was thought by the Chinese to be a panacea as well as a love potion. Recently in the United States, there has been a major resurgence in the consumption of ginseng as a tonic, cathartic, and aphrodisiac. Chemical evidence supports the stimulatory effects of ginseng. Several saponins, molecules in which sugars are attached to steroids, such as panax sapogenin, have been isolated from ginseng root extracts. As a bridge to the next section, there is good old cannabis. The article about cannabis on the presumably popular online site Healthline is headed by an alluring photo of two tattooed women fondling one another, which I confess I found rather exciting. Then it goes on to tell us the following. Set aside the chocolate and oysters. 
There's a new aphrodisiac in town that can help take your sexual pleasure to another level. Yep, we're talking about cannabis. The research continues into cannabis and its benefits in and out of the bedroom. 68.5% of people in one study said sex while using cannabis was more pleasurable. Curious? So were we. So we reached out to John Renko, cannabis expert and co-founder of Go Love CBD Naturals, and Jordan Tischler, a Harvard physician and medical cannabis therapeutic specialist who runs Inhale MD. They shared more on choosing the right strain and product for the most mind-blowing sexual experience, no matter what type of mood you're in. Dr. Tischler believes that different strains can in some cases lead to different preferences during sex, but don't guarantee any outcomes. He advises his patients to ignore strains altogether and focus on dosing and method of delivery. Renko, on the other hand, believes the real magic lies in the terpenes when it comes to coming to defining the effects of each strain. Terpenes are compounds found in plants that are responsible for the aroma and flavor. If one cannabis plant smells like diesel and another reminds you of lemons, well, that's the terpenes at work. Terpenes impact the different effects of cannabis, though how is not clear yet. To ramp up your sex drive, Renko recommends choosing strains with high levels of the terpene limonene, like do si -dos, and wedding cake. Both are indica-dominant, high-THC hybrids that hit you fast with a body-warming euphoria before melting into blissful relaxation. Heavens to Betsy! Who knew? In a 1912 paper by Sidney Cohen of my former employer, the Neuropsychiatric Institute at UCLA, published in the Journal of Psychiatric Drugs, he tells us that although one may not perceive it, countercultural beliefs have had their impact on the dominant culture. Marijuana has some enhancing effects upon sexual proceedings for some individuals. It may be sexually evocative and gratifying. Nonspecific factors play an important role in this matter. Opposite effects may occur and an endocrinologic basis for actual diminution of drives and potency may exist. The final paradox is that cannabis's enjoyment for sexual arousal is primarily an activity of young adults. The older age group, most in need of sexual support and assistance, are less frequently involved in its use. It is unclear why this dichotomy between need and utilization exists." Unquote. That would come as a surprise for a number of over-40 potheads I run into from time to time, although to the best of my knowledge, which is slim, none of them use it for sex. In fact, it has never been clear to me what they use it for. Of course, one could say the same for a fine bottle of Chateau Aubryon. I once commented to two acquaintances, one now sadly deceased, who were regular pot smokers that the only things that marijuana was good for were listening to music and sex. They were both appalled. And honestly, I'm not sure why. It was as if the purpose of cannabis was not to enhance any particular experience. It was more as if for them, smoking weed had no purpose at all. So just what is going on when a human consumes cannabis? Wikipedia tells us that, quote, once the cannabinoid receptors are activated by THC, dopamine, a chemical linked with the affects of our reward system, is released. The areas of the brain that govern sexual functioning that are then influenced by the released dopamine can result or cause increased sexual pleasure. Most studies conducted to understand this influence from cannabis are limited and consist of small sample sizes. Furthermore, these are survey studies and rely on participants' ability to recall details of such experiences. Boy, you know, people get high and are supposed to recall everything. Hmm. However, two studies do show results that reveal a majority of participants had increased desire for sex, increased sensitivity to sensations, and increased sexual satisfaction, but 
Wikipedia provides no references for this. Hello? So we here at Explore Ecstatic Sensuality did our own research. One study made available in the Open Access Journal of Sexual Medicine by Becky K. Lynn, M.D., of the St. Louis University School of Medicine, reports on a study undertaken in 2016 and 2017 of 373 women within a single academic obstetrics and gynecology practice. Before we jump into the results of their study, let's take a moment to present the existing knowledge base on which their research was formulated. More research we've done for you, you lucky people. Endocannabinoids, which are structurally similar to marijuana, are known to help regulate sexual function. The cannabinoid receptor discovered in the 1990s has been mapped to several areas of the brain that play a role in sexual function. Cannabinoids and endocannabinoids interact with the hormones and neurotransmitters that affect sexual behavior. Although these interactions have not been clearly illuminated, some studies in rodents have helped to clarify the relationship between cannabinoids and the hormones and neurotransmitters that affect sexual behavior. Although there is less data on human subjects, some studies have measured patients' perceptions of the effects of marijuana on sexual function. Studies have reported an increase in desire and improvement in the quality of orgasm. Most recently, Carolyn Klein of the University of British Columbia and her associates evaluated the correlation between serum levels of two endogenous endocannabinoids and found a significant negative correlation between endocannabinoids and both physiological and subjective arousal in women. Hmm. With that in mind, let's push the pause button on Dr. Becky Lynn's research results and talk a little bit about Carolyn Klein's study. Sparing you the details, their study involves showing a 10-minute video clip containing erotic material, namely a nude heterosexual couple engaging in foreplay and subsequent sexual intercourse, and which has previously been found to increase physiological and subjective sexual arousal reliably in women. Is this on Netflix? YouTube? I'm just asking. Their study involved the use of a device, previously termed an arousometer, which was constructed and employed in the study to measure continuous subjective sexual arousal. The device consists of a computer mouse mounted on a metal track with ten equally spaced intervals ranging from two, sexually turned off, to seven, highly sexually aroused, with zero reflecting neutral or the absence of positive or negative sexual feelings. Participants are instructed to continuously monitor and indicate subjective feelings of sexual arousal during viewing of the film. This is done through manipulation of the computer mouse along the numbered track. We may remark here that in my business, similar devices are used during test screenings of feature films and television programs. Is there any difference anymore, one might ask? Before sample audiences, although in most cases our primary concern is not how sexually aroused the viewer is. Who knows, perhaps it should be. Well, try that next time. In contrast to other researchers, Carolyn Klein's Canadian study suggests, and here we quote her directly, that cannabinoid receptor agonists such as cannabis may impair sexual arousal in women. Given that cannabis has a reputation as being an aphrodisiac, and that some research has found that individuals specifically use cannabis to try to facilitate sexual function, the use of cannabis for this purpose may be counterproductive. Unquote. Now we're pushing the play button on Becky Lynn's study. The primary outcome measure was satisfaction in the sexual domains of drive orgasm lubrication, dyspareunia, and overall sexual experience. The secondary outcome measure was the effect of the frequency of marijuana use on satisfaction. Of the 373 participants, 34%, 127, reported having used marijuana before sexual activity. Most women reported increases in sex drive, improvement in orgasm, decrease in pain, but no change in lubrication. After adjusting for race, women who reported marijuana use before sexual activity 
had 2.13 times higher odds of reporting satisfactory orgasms than women who reported no marijuana use before sexual activity. After adjusting for race and age, women with frequent marijuana use, regardless of use before sex or not, had 2.10 times higher odds of reporting satisfactory orgasms than those with infrequent marijuana use. To put this another way, women who are regular cannabis users have more than twice the number of orgasms than other women have. And this is not specifically about whether a woman smokes a joint or pops an edible before having sex on any particular occasion. The question of how marijuana leads to these positive changes in sexual function is unknown. It has been postulated that it leads to improvement in sexual function simply by lowering stress and anxiety. We would like to jump in here and comment that some people are known to have become paranoid after using cannabis, particularly the very strong types now available, which have even been used as date rape drugs. So beware. It, namely cannabis, may slow the temporal perception of time and prolong the feelings of pleasurable sensation. It stretches things out. It may lower sexual inhibitions and increase confidence and a willingness to experiment. Marijuana is also known to heighten sensations such as touch, smell, sight, taste, and hearing. Some regular female marijuana users reported a higher sensation of touch and increased physical closeness when using marijuana before sex. Female sexual function is not only regulated by hormones, but also by centrally acting neurotransmitters such as dopamine and serotonin. Dopamine is a key prosexual moderator in normal excitatory female sexual functions. Activation of cannabinoid receptors has been shown to enhance dopamine, which may be another pathway by which marijuana affects sexual function. Cannabinoid receptors have also been located to other areas of the brain that control sexual function, including the hypothalamus, prefrontal cortex, amygdala, and hippocampus. Serum levels of endocannabinoids have been correlated with both subjective and objective measures of arousal. So, to coin a phrase, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Let us begin with a paper by Magdalena Wyszla, Institute of Psychology, Karten Stefan Wyszynski, University, Warsaw, Poland, Shane W. Krauss, and Karol Wyszynku, published in May of 2022 in the journal Comprehensive Psychiatry. Dr. Wyszla and her associates, let us begin with a paper by Magdalena Wyszla, Institute of Psychology, Karl Stefan Wyszlowski University. Let us begin with a paper by Magdalena Wisla, Institute of Psychology, Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University, Warsaw, Poland, Shane W. Kraus and Karnal Lepschluka, published in May of 2022 in the journal Comprehensive Psychiatry. Dr. Wisla and her associates explain the psychedelics are a group of compounds that can be found in living organisms for example, psilocybin, as well as synthesized artificially, e.g. lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD. Despite their diversified molecular structure, they share one significant characteristic, a common hallucinogenic influence on changes in mood, perception, and cognition. Most psychedelic drugs fall into one of three families of chemical compounds, tryptamines, phenethylamines, or lysergamides, and many tend to act via serotonin 2A receptor agonism. Later, we are going to discuss very recent findings which dispute the long-held view that depression is caused by serotonin abnormalities, particularly by lower levels or reduced activity of serotonin. That having been said, let us proceed. When compounds bind to serotonin 5-HT2A receptors, they modulate the activity of key circuits in the brain involved with sensory perception and cognition. However, the exact nature of how psychedelics induce changes in perception and cognition via the 5-H2A receptor is still unknown. 
Although reduction in default mode network activity and increased functional connectivity between regions in the brain as a result may be one of the most relevant pharmacological mechanisms underpinning the psychedelic experience, particularly so-called ego death. We question whether ego death is actually what occurs during the psychedelic experience. In this connection, we will discuss later neuropsychoanalyst Mark Solm's view that it is the id which is conscious, while the ego is unconscious. The psychedelic experience is often compared to non-ordinary forms of consciousness, such as those experienced in meditation, mystical experiences, and near-death experiences, which also appear to be primarily underpinned by altered default mode network activity. There exists some evidence for psychedelics, antidepressant, and anxiolytic properties. For LSD and psilocybin, there is a moderate level of evidence, as well as a low-slash-moderate level of evidence for ayahuasca and its alkaloids. The fact that MDMA, ecstasy, assisted therapy has already entered phase 3 clinical trial for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorders reflects the growing recognition of the therapeutic potential of psychedelics in the treatment of psychiatric disorders. A possible explanation for the psychedelics-induced reduction of anxiety and depressive symptoms is the stimulation of the expression of brain-derived neurotropic factors also associated with antidepressants' effectiveness. The author's primary concern was the effectiveness of psychedelics in treatment of compulsive sexual behavior disorder. CSBD is a new diagnostic entity recently introduced in International Classification of Diseases 11th Revision, ICD. It is characterized by the inability to control one's sexual impulses, thoughts, and behaviors which manifests as a preoccupation with the sexual domain to the point that one neglects other areas of life and experiences negative consequences thereby, unsuccessful attempts to refrain from or limit sexual activity, and continuous engagement in sexual behavior despite little or no satisfaction derived from it. It has been suggested that compulsive sexual behavior disorder results from experiential avoidance, which is to say, attempts to avoid and escape one's own internal experiences. Both mindfulness and psychedelic experience reduce avoidance, which is common for both PTSD and compulsive sexual behavior disorder. The subjective findings reported during mindfulness practice and after psychedelic ingestion are similar and include, among others, greater flexibility, elevated mood, enhanced attention and sensory perception, as well as diminished, or should we say more flexible, sense of self. To sum up these findings, heightened experiential avoidance is often observed in patients with compulsive sexual behavior disorder, and psychedelics reduce experiential avoidance through exposure and promote acceptance, that is to say, acceptance of one's own experience, including inner experience. To mention some additional psychedelic drugs you may have heard of, psilocin 4-HO-DMT is the dephosphorylated active metabolite of the indole alkaloid psilocybin and a substituted tryptamine, which is produced in over 200 species of fungi. Of the classical psychedelics, so to speak. Psilocybin has attracted the greatest academic interest regarding its ability to manifest mystical experiences, although all psychedelics are capable of doing so to variable degrees. Which begs the question, what is a mystical experience? In our view, evolution has led to all species developing a filtering system which excludes from their brains sensory data internal and external, that is not necessary for survival. What psychedelic substances and drugs do is nothing but to let that information in. So what passes for a mystical experience is merely this jumble of data, 
a jumble, the experience of which many falsely interpret as mystical, as something which implies a connection to some cosmic one, whereas, in fact, it is nothing of the sort. It's merely noise. This makes me think of our experience of the contemporary world. We are so drugged by the noise of media and the general noise of our environment that we interpret many things as art or culture, whereas they are merely noise. Mescaline is a phentalamine alkaloid found in various species of cacti, the most well-known being peyote, Lophophora williamsi, and San Pedro. Mescaline has effects comparable to those of LSD and psilocybin, albeit with a greater emphasis on colors and patterns. So here we are talking about psychedelic sex. And if what comes to your mind is a group of unkempt people sitting around listening to the Grateful Dead, the most boring rock group in the entire world, the sure turnoff of all music I have ever been exposed to involuntarily, or Ravi Shankar, you know, with those ragas and all those sorts of things, plunk, 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 plunk. Yes, they get you into a state, all right. I don't know what that state is. Maybe New Jersey, someplace you never want to go. Psychedelic sex. Oh, my God. That sounds really hideous if you think about the associations of psychedelic and sex. But hold on just a minute. Hold on a little bit. You think about the reasons that people gave at the very beginning of this episode, What's Your Name and Bus, published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior. And they gave some reasons for why people have sex, and one of them was to get closer to God. Back to that in a moment. And another was the altruistic reason to make the other person feel good about themselves, because otherwise they'll feel like bleep if I don't have sex with them. Jeepers. That kind of, sounds kind of hideous. Although, if you're a really nice person, that's maybe the sort of thing that you go around doing. And <laughs> Do you really have psychedelic sex like that? Do you really have that really hot sex? You know what I'm talking about? I don't have to explain it to you. Anybody who's had that really hot sex knows exactly what I'm talking about. You don't need the Explore Ecstatic Sensuality podcast to tell you what that is. Just think about it in your memories and then plan for it in your future, man. When you see a gorgeous person of the opposite sex, man, and by man I'm encompassing males and females, then just go for it. They want it too, I bet. Well, yeah, make sure that they want it before you do anything. But that stuff about I want to have sex in order to get closer to God. So let's think about what that might mean in, you know, in Armenian mythology. You have Ashtigak, goddess of fertility and love. In Aztec mythology, you have Wakindil Kretzal, goddess of fertility, beauty, and female sexual power. In Canaanite mythology, you have Astarte, a good one, goddess of sexual love, fertility, and warfare. And you also have Quetash, goddess of love, beauty, and sex. In Chinese mythology, you have Yang Lao, a Chinese god of love who binds two people together with an invisible red string, a little bit of you know, bondage, and bondage and discipline. In Egyptian mythology, it gets pretty good. Bess, goddess of music, dance, and sexual pleasure. You know, I read ancient Egyptian. I read ancient Egyptian and studied all that stuff in every phase of the language, and I can speak it and write it and all that sort of stuff. So I know all these deities. They're, they're boss deities. Bess, goddess of music, dance, and sexual pleasure. Hathor, goddess of the sky, love, beauty, and music. And Bastet, goddess of felines, love, sexuality, protection, beauty. And dance. Himenaos, goddess of marriage and marriage feasts. Well, you know, unless you really, really want to do that. I have a rule, by the way, and that is never attend the weddings or marriage rites of women I'm in love with. 
unless they're getting married to me, which is very unlikely to happen, Pothos, god of sexual longing, yearning, and desire. Lithuanian mythology. Any uh, Lithuanians out there? Milda, goddess of love and freedom. Moroccan mythology. Kandisa, goddess of lust, who first seduces men, then drives them insane. Been there, done that. Voodoo, Baron Lacroix, Baron Lacroix, who, interestingly enough, plays a major part in my novels, which are coming up and which you will all want to read, and they're likely to get you just simply too hot. I'm sorry, that's the nature of my novels. So, let's go out there and have psychedelic sex. Let's go out there and have unrestrained sex. If substances play a part in that, by all means. If Tantra plays a part in that, by all means. Whatever you need to do, just do it. And lest we forget, we are talking here about sensuality. We are talking about sex involving the mind, the body, in every part of the mind and the body. When you have sex of this sort, you are feeling your sexuality, your sensuality, your eroticism in every part of your being. And the person you are with is feeling their sensuality, their eroticism in every part of their body and in every part of their being. It's all happening at once. It is something over which, in a certain way, you have lost control, but not really. The control element, the control aspect, the will, never goes away. The will to improvise, the imagination never goes away. The creativity never, ever goes away during sexuality. The enjoyment of your partner's creativity and will and innovation and imagination during sex never, ever goes away. I think a little bit about, uh, about jazz. I love jazz. But, you know, something about jazz, one thing about jazz is that there is a, what do they call it, like in gospel music, there is a statement and a response going back to a religious church situation and probably going back before that to Africa. And this is something we hear a lot in really great jazz music. You have Ornette making a statement and then Don Cherry coming in with another statement, kind of an an example I really like. But then jazz goes to another level in which the two instrumentalists are playing together, playing off each other, with none of them ever being silent, none of them ever waiting for the other. They're playing together. They're making music together. And in doing so, they rise to new heights. They fall back a little bit. They rise to new heights again. This is the kind of sex that we regard as psychedelic sex. And after this type of sex, (laughs) which may take a while to end, after this type of sex, you will feel with your partner a sense of joy. You have discovered joyous love. 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 Love is so important to sex. Love is so important to life. This is something we all need to think about, which is simply how sex increases love, how sex is a natural response to love, how sex, sensuality, are a part of love. You can go through life and have a nice relationship, a nice kind of sweet, tender relationship with someone and never get to this level. It's like almost like a platonic type of relationship. It's like companionship relationship. I've talked about this in previous podcasts, previous episodes. Two people together, it's kind of like roommates. Roommates with uh, benefits, but the benefits are not that great. Roommate sex. Not what we're talking about here. We're talking about taking sex 
to use a cliche, to an entirely new level, but it's beyond the whole notion of levels. It's beyond the whole notion of trying to get somewhere and then getting somewhere. It's, it's not about effort. I've said elsewhere that life should have an objective and that sort of thing, but if you set an objective to, we're going to have great sex, it may happen, but very likely will not. This is what we mean by psychedelic sex. Now, let us turn to what, in our opinion, is a groundbreaking article entitled Psychedelics and Connectedness, published in the August 2017 issue of the journal Psychopharmacology. The authors were members of the Psychedelic Research Group, Center for Psychiatry, Department of Medicine, Imperial College, London. April 2017 featured the largest ever conference on the topic of psychedelic science. It was held in Oakland, California, and was attended by 3,000 people from over 40 different countries. Among the 175-plus speakers were Tom Insell, former director of the National Institute for Mental Health, and Paul Zumergrad, past president of the American Psychiatric Association, who spoke enthusiastically and encouragingly about the therapeutic use of psychedelic substances such as psilocybin, LSD, and DMT, ayahuasca. Unquote. Here the authors are telling us that DMT, NN dimethyltryptamine, is the same as ayahuasca. This is, however, not precisely the case. DMT containing plants are commonly used in indigenous Amazonian shamanic practices. It is usually one of the main active constituents of the drink ayahuasca. However, ayahuasca is sometimes brewed with plants that do not produce DMT. Ayahuasca is a psychedelic and entheogenic mixed drink brew commonly made out of Banisteria copsa vine and the Sicoria veritas shrub or a substitute, and possibly other ingredients. We have been advised that datura is a key ingredient in shamanic ayahuasca. Anthropologists tell us that indigenous groups with a great deal of experience with and detailed knowledge of datura have been known to use Datura spiritually, including the Navajo and especially the Havar Supai. Adequate knowledge of Datura's properties is necessary to facilitate a safe experience. The ancient inhabitants of what became Central and Southern California used to ingest Datura to commune with deities through visions. The Southern Paiute believe that Datura can help locate missing objects. In ancient Mexico, Datura also played an important role in the religion of the Aztecs and the practices of their medicine men and necromancers. It was reportedly used by the Aztecs for ritual sacrifices and malevolent purposes as well. In modern-day Mexico, some Datura species are still used for sorcery and other occult practices, mostly in the southern region of Veracruz, specifically in the city of Catamaco. German anthropologist Christian Reich has said, quote, a mild dosage produces medicinal and healing effects. A moderate dosage produces aphrodisiac effects. And high dosages are used for shamanic purposes. According to the online source netmeds.com, Datura offers a one-shot traditional remedy for boosting libido and improving fertility in both men and women. It showcases strong aphrodisiac properties that not only help in reducing mental stress and anxiety, but also stimulate the reproductive hormones for increasing libido. It plays a key role in increasing virility and stamina in men. Consuming purified detura seeds by sipping them in milk has been known to increase blood circulation in the genitals, which thereby improve the production of male hormones like testosterone and luteinizing hormone, thus improving the motility and quality of sperm in the male. Unquote. Then there is Salvia divinorum. Salvia divinorum is a rare species of sage that is native to a remote region of Oaxaca, Mexico, where it has been used for hundreds of years in shamanic healing rituals by the Mazatec Indians. When the leaves of the plant are chewed or smoked, 
a relatively short-acting psychedelic or visionary experience generally follows. In large enough doses, salvia divinorum is one of the most powerful psychedelic substances known, similar to ayahuasca in its effects. In smaller doses, however, salvia divinorum is said to have aphrodisiac effects, to increase sensual awareness, and to dramatically enhance one's tactile sensitivity during sex. Although the Mazatec curanderas cautionally suggests that people abstain from sex for four days prior to using salvia divinorum, the origin of this advice is unknown. We suspect that this belief may have resulted from a Catholic influence on the Indians rather than any actual problem with mixing sex and salvia divinorum. Most people I've spoken to say that the most effective way to use salvia divinorum for sex is as a sublingual extract that one holds under one's tongue for 15 minutes. This method ensures that one is getting precisely the dosage that he or she intends, and it lengthens the duration of the experience. Smoking salvia divinorum generally lasts for only around 15 minutes, while the sublingual salvia divinorum extracts last closer to an hour. With regard to dosage, preparations differ in strength, but one should aim for a mild or moderate level experience. However, before we move on, there is also henbane, which has the telltale Latin species name of Pocula amatoria. It played an important role in the ointment and potions of witches. In medieval bathhouses, henbane seeds were on the oven whereupon men and women would collide together. Unquote. Justinian gave the Pocula Amatoria, which literally means love potion, equal status to the magical arts in the Lex Cornelia, and their use has been strongly punished since the 13th century and the reign of Emperor Friedrich II. In fact, into the 18th century, Prussian county law still designated severe punishments for using love potions. The German expression Alt-Sitzerkraut, old sitter herb, refers to the use of henbane to get rid of an inactive old person sitting on a bench. It's a German sort of mentality, don't you know? So here once again we find a link between spirituality, psychedelics, shamanism, and eroticism. After that divigation, let us return to the Historic Psychedelic Sciences Conference. The theme of connectedness was pervasive at psychedelic science, featuring consistently among speakers' presentations. Of the 17 patients in one research study who endorsed the treatment's effectiveness, all made reference to one particular mediating factor, a renewed sense of connection or connectedness. This raises the question of whether psychedelic therapy targets a core factor underlying mental health. These London researchers believe that it does, and that connectedness is the key. Connectedness, as it was described in patients in this study, encompassed not only connection to others, i.e. social connectedness, and the world in general, e.g. connectedness to nature, but also connection to the self. Post-treatment, participants referred to feeling reconnected to past values, pleasures, and hobbies, as well as feeling more integrated, embodied, and at peace with themselves and their own troubled backgrounds. It is a working hypothesis of this Imperial College group that connection to self is a bedrock from which connection to others and the world can follow most naturally. Another hypothesis is that positive therapeutic outcomes could be jeopardized if the primary connection to self-stage is leapfrog, i.e., due to incomplete psychological integration. It is notable in this regard that many patients in their trial study felt that the process and effect of being prescribed conventional treatments had merely reinforced their sense of disconnection. These researchers were indeed mindful of the scientifically delicate association between psychedelics and so-called mystical experience. Despite previously expressed concerns regarding this construct, 
psychedelic-induced mystical experiences have been found to predict long-term increases in psychological well-being, as well as clinical improvements after psychedelic therapy. Given the apparent positive mediational value of such experiences, it seems pertinent to better understand where their value lies. And again, these psychologists from Imperial College London suspect that connectedness may be the key. Psychedelics initiate their signature subjective effects via serotonin 2A receptor agonism. Since psychedelics hijack an existing system, it is natural to ask what evolutionary role that system has played throughout our species' development, and whether understanding this may shed light on our understanding of the functioning of brain serotonin more generally. Relevant questions have recently been explored. In brief, these authors have proposed that brain serotonin 2A receptor signaling mediates a state of rapid plasticity that is conducive to major changes, for example, in outlook and or in behavior, when such change feels necessary, e.g. to aid mental or physical survival. Such a function may be related to humans' unique capacity for adaptability. However, as many of our listeners may have heard or read, there is the following. A major new umbrella review, an overview of existing meta-analyses and systematic reviews, was published on July 20, 2022, in the journal Molecular Psychiatry. It suggests that depression is not likely caused by a chemical imbalance and calls into question what antidepressant medications do. This is because most antidepressants are selective serotonin uptake inhibitors, SSRIs, which were originally said to function by correcting abnormally low serotonin levels. In fact, there is no other accepted pharmacological mechanism by which antidepressants affect the symptoms of depression. Lead author Joanna Moncrief, a professor of psychiatry at University College London, and a consultant psychiatrist at Northeast London Foundation Trust said, It is always difficult to prove a negative, but I think we can safely say that after a vast amount of research conducted over several decades, there is no convincing evidence that depression is caused by serotonin abnormalities, particularly by lower levels or reduced activities of serotonin. That's a lot to swallow. However, with that having been said, we return to the research report on psychedelics published in the peer-reviewed journal Psychopharmacology. In this report, the authors write a good deal about ego dissolution and about how, as they see it, ego dissolution is one of the benefits, in quotes, of the use of psychedelics in therapy and of how ego dissolution leads to connectedness in various manifestations. Here, at Explore Ecstatic Sensuality, we take a different point of view. What we propose is not dissolving the ego, but instead to follow Sigmund Freud's suggestion, where once there was id, now ego, there shall be. The id, residing in the unconscious, is inhabited not only with desires, including desires for sex, and what's wrong with that, but also with things we have repressed because we have been unable to deal with them. As we have discussed in several previous episodes, what we repress returns in other forms, often in compulsive behavior. As part of its etiology, in repression of sexual impulses, the ego did not understand and had no means or mechanisms to deal with. Jacques Lacan offers us the notion that the return of the repressed and the repressed are one and the same. This assertion is strictly correlative to the idea that the unconscious is not an internal space or mentality. The Lacanian unconscious is not a depth psychology or irreducibly intrapsychic collection of contents and impulses. It is, by contrast, an external unconscious, which is fashioned out of and made possible by practices of language, by the utilization and arrangement of words, signifiers. It is important to stress that the idea of the signifier here is broader than words alone, because after all, images are signifiers, as are semaphores, and instances of sign language, each of which fulfill the function of a signifier. That is to say, 
Each of these examples can be read. They convey meaning for someone, indeed for another, even if what they convey is not always immediately evident. Furthermore, as is the case for all signifiers in Lacan, they are polyvalent. They are able to carry more than one possible meaning simultaneously. How, then, to approach Lacan's idea that the repressed and the return of the repressed are one and the same? By taking seriously for the moment that in speaking I create the possibility of a repressed, or, more accurately, of a potential return of the repressed. I repeat, of a potential return of the repressed. In speaking, we create the possibility of a potential return of the repressed. Everything we say creates the possibility of a potential return of the repressed at some point in the future. And that return will be something of which we are unaware. And as Lacan so pertinently explains to us, the repressed and the return of the repressed are one and the same. Jacques Lacan's notion of the unconscious is not thus psychological, certainly not in any narrow sense of the word, but rather linguistic in its functioning. Or taking his son-in-law Jacques Alain Miller's lead, we may speak simply of the linguistic structure of psychology. This, then, is one way of understanding Lacan's the unconscious is structured like a language, namely that the unconscious is brought about by and is hence contingent upon the production of language, or indeed of signifiers. One supposes that the logical extension of such lines of thought is that humans, among cognizant species, uniquely have an unconscious because humans uniquely have language. We are always creating psychologically burdensome, potentially neurosis-producing misunderstandings, both within ourselves, leading to guilt in some cases, or with others. And what is doing this? Signifiers, and mainly language. Recently, South African neuropsychoanalyst Mark Soames offers a new and fecund explanation of the ego and the id, where they are and what they do. And we quote him, Two aspects of the body are represented in the brain, and they are represented differently. The most important difference is that the brain regions for the two aspects of the body are associated with different aspects of consciousness. Very broadly speaking, the brainstem mechanisms derived from the autonomic body are associated with affective consciousness, and the cortical mechanisms derived from the sensorimotor body are associated with cognitive consciousness. Moreover, the upper brainstem is intrinsically conscious, whereas the cortex is not. It derives its consciousness from the brainstem. These facts have substantial implications for psychoanalytic metapsychology because the upper brainstem and associated limbic structures performs the function that Freud attributed to the id, while the cortex and associated forebrain structures performs the function he attributed to the ego. That means that the id is the fount of consciousness and the ego is unconscious in itself. Let us hope that Professor Solms, who may be found on YouTube and also other places online, and others continue on in this research. We here at the Explore Ecstatic Sensuality podcast look forward to following further developments avidly and sharing them with you. However, back to Lacan, words, and love. The following is from his 19th seminar, entitled Upir, or worse. People speak about love in analysis, that is to say, when they're speaking with their shrinks. All things considered, they don't speak about it any more here, on the couch, than anywhere else, since, after all, this is what love is for. This is not what is most gratifying, but in the end, in mundane terms, people speak about it a great deal. It is even tremendous that people still go on about it, that is to say, love, after all this time, because they might have noticed, after all this time, that it hasn't made it any more successful. It is clear, therefore, that it is by speaking 
that one makes love. Thank you.